Hello and welcome to our roundtable discussion group 2011. Today is the day after April Fools. For all of you good boys and girls, yesterday you didn't pull any nasty pranks on anybody, I hope. You know, the innocent little non-offending or hurting jokes are okay, but you know, some people can get just carried away with that stuff, you know? So watch it. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, that that comes from a person who's got caught a couple of times for being too gullible. That's what that is. Oh, so April second, two thousand eleven. This is the round table discussion group. Yes, awesomeness. That's what it is. Today we're talking about transgender uh, people, persons, issues, the whole. Gambit. We even have a special guest calling um, 30 minutes after the hour, approximately 24 minutes from now. Yes, we'll tell you more about that in a little bit, probably when she calls, you know, I'm not going to get too much into it. But she is the founding executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality. Yeah, Mara is her name, and she's supposed to be calling us somewhere around 30 minutes after the hour. And and hopefully spend at least 30 minutes with us, and maybe we can entice her to stay a little bit longer. Also, of course, we have a couple of our regular panelists on the show with us today. What would the round table be without them? Oh, yes, it's always more fun. It is. Boy, this is a lot more fun with a second person. Boy, this is a lot more fun with a second person. Boy. That's what it is. It's a lot more fun with a second person. And don't you forget it. Then that's why we have uh, Rob, and hopefully Cisco's gotten back. He was kind of missing in action still for a moment. And we've got Kale with us from Hawaii. Rob and Cisco, of course, are up in the New York area. But along with them, Rob and Cisco got brought a very special friend along. And her name is... Jamie. Jamie's in upstate New York. So first I gotta say hello to Jamie since you're the bright shining guest of the hour. Hi. Hello, how are you? I'm I you know, any day I get up and I put two feet down on the ground and I can get out of bed, it's a good day. Definitely. Kale, good morning. Aloha <laughs> from Hawaii. <laughs> Somebody woke up. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. You didn't Good sound. Morning, he didn't sound so awake five minutes ago. All of a sudden, boom! I want to know what kind of coffee you're drinking over there. <laughs> Strong <laughs> Connor coffee, baby. Strong Connor coffee. <laughs> and of course, Rob. Rob is Cisco back yet? Uh, Cisco's not back yet. He's on his way, but I'm here and uh, looking forward to the show. Awesome. Pardon me one moment while I stir my hot cup of coffee. <laughs> you know, I started the intro to the show and I said, oh my God, my coffee cup's empty. This is just sacrilegious. That cannot happen. <laughs> we don't like that. So, so Jamie is in upstate New York. Jamie is uh, transgender and we're glad to have you with us. She, Jamie has already said she's going to opt out of the podium moments. So... Uh, <laughs> so we'll move to, uh, let's see, who had it first? Oh, Cisco's the one that, he. I think he took it first. I don't think he had nothing. He just took it first. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Kali, we'll let you go. Kali, you get first choice today. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I, I'm so thrilled that we are having Jamie from upstate New York with us, and I hopefully we will hear from Mara, and uh, I can't wait to hear what she has to say on a few certain topics. Uh, I just want to uh, give you a bit of news that uh, was in the news yesterday. Uh, Aetna, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, was introduced into the House by uh, Re Representative Barney Frank, uh, who's a Democrat from Maine, uh, which is uh, a huge, huge, huge thing for transgender the, the transgender community, and uh, we'll probably be talking more about that in a little bit. Uh, 
And I also would like to mention that uh, the there is a uh, new uh, federal report that urges a government study on trans health, and I'm sure we'll be talking about that in a little bit as well. Um, both of these articles, for those uh, out there on computers, can be found at transequality.org. Uh, that's pretty much what I have to say. I'm going to uh, open this up back to Tom and... Uh, Maybe uh, Rob has a little bit for us as well. Yee-ha! Well, didn't you just get right with it? <laughs> <laughs> Rob, go ahead, Rob. Good morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Um, just wanted to uh, state that I'm doing this uh, this radio show because um, you know the, the transgender. Um, transgender movement has is, is such a large umbrella and a lot of people don't understand what the umbrella is I mean it's transsexual it's cross dressers transvestites drag kings drag queens uh, gender queer people who live in a cross gender life and uh, androgyny so there's a lot of um, a lot of questions it's, it's not as cut and dry as the LGB in LGBT um, so I'm glad we are doing this show I have a uh, friend um, who joined us today, uh, Janie. So I'm, I'm glad she came in to give us the retrospective of the um, of the transgender community. I also have another um, my my brother's lover, gay lover's um, sister's uh, daughter. Husband is in is uh, has, has came out to the family and said that they were transgendering and I thought that was great and I've just been more in more contact with them and we've been chatting and um, her name is Julie Julie and Melissa and uh, Julie um, actually sent a letter in today um, that I can I can either read now I probably can so kind of open it up it's a little long so um, bear with me so this is uh, Melissa and Julie's story I've always known that I was a girl among my first memories after beginning elementary school is the friendship I had with another boy in my class. We would play that we were, gr- we were girls. While I know we were too young to understand the psychology of gender and sexuality, we do know one thing. We were girls. I also remember knowing that we had to do this plain in private. There was no one instance which I can recall as a learning experience as far as that is concerned. I just know that when we didn't share this game, that we, that I just know that we didn't share this game with anyone else. She goes on to say, I can remember being eight and nine years old, laying in bed at night, praying, when I still believed in that sort of thing, um, that I would wake up a girl, any girl, Valerie Bertinelli was a popular goal of mine, and I remember really, really wishing I could be Amy Carter, in school, I had the usual girlfriends, but they were all girls. I was jealous of, I wish I could be, whose clothes I coveted. It wasn't until I was 10 or 11 that I found out what I was, and I will always remember how, by seeing Renee Richards on Phil Donahue. That moment is stamped indelibly in my mind. Sadly, I had also realized around that time, too, that admitting any of this to people was a huge no-no. I knew I wasn't gay, but I also knew from hearing enough jokes and comments that I was close enough to that to have to be ashamed. Um, She says, puberty was a bitch. Um, I was fluid enough sexually to make it all confusing and was also molested over a long period of time by an uncle, which also made things very confusing. I had no clue what I was or what I should do, so I did a little bit of everything. Being completely in the middle of the Kinsey scale, I could get away with playing it straight enough to date girls, but was always honest about who, what I was, so those relationships never had much of a chance. I was constantly outing myself to friends, too, which in a, in, in a small town PA, Pennsylvania, was not advisable. In the mid 1980s, neither fooling around with other boys, neither was fooling around with other boys and being honest. 
I wandered around after high school doing a year, doing a year and a half at Temple Ambler campus, campus before dropping out for a year or two, for, after dropping out for a year or two. That led to my getting married on my 21st birthday, largely to prove, to prove I was whatever every, everybody else wanted me to be. I believe you can imagine how that went. My gender identity was a huge issue with us, and she could not handle it. Had she not gotten sick, brain cancer, I'm sure that we would have ended up divorcing when I transitioned. Her getting sick, we had been married 10 years, put everything on hold for quite a while. While technically I had the freedom to move forward with transitioning, which she and I had discussed before her illness, I was under an incredible amount of social pressure to be a martyr to her illness and to do nothing at all for myself. If I wanted the assistance of my family and the members of our small world backwards ass fuck community, um, maddeningly, I became involved with a woman who seemed to be supportive, but ended being a complete mind fuck. I, sp I split from her for a little bit and actually started <coughs> hormones for a while. But for our daughter's sake, we got back together, but only because I agreed to stop the hormones. She was out of the picture not long after that, but then my life truly began. That's when she met Melissa. From the very beginning, she was honest with her, though maybe not her myself, but about, about who and what I was. I tried harder than I did with anyone to be a, the man I thought she wanted. Of course, Melissa has never quite wanted a typical man, and so more comfortable I became with her, the more I realized that I had to transition. The depression became overwhelming. I had been depressed about being trans before, two near suicides with hospitalizations, but this was much stronger. I knew that I was going to end up dead and soon. So one night last August, after a bottle of cheap wine, I started crying and told her that if I didn't transition, I was going to be gone. She said, okay, that was it. Okay, there was no hesitation, recrimination, no wailing, no gnashing of teeth, just okay. And here we are. My family has had 30 years to deal with the fact that I was not straight and they could never deal with that. They've had 10 to 15 years to deal with the fact that I am trans. Their reactions range from thinking it's just a stage to trying to, they think it's just a stage to trying to pray it away when they realized I was transitioning this time. They stopped talking to us. My parents live three blocks away from us and we have not been welcome in their home, nor has either of them visited us. My sister prays for me, but her Christian charity does not include allowing me in her home for fear of scar scaring her friends. And my brother has attacked us both verbally for being so disrespectful towards my parents by transitioning. Wow. And this and it's just two more paragraphs. What is saddest so of all I'm familiar. What what is saddest of all to me is that while my children support me, a few of them are being sucked into the games my parents and sister are playing. But we soldier on. Melissa and I are happy, and that's what counts, right, Julie? So, I think that's a really powerful um, letter that she wrote to us, um, and I'm glad we could share it on the show today because um, it's it's really wild. We're still going through so much inequality in this country, just even from our own families. Mm -hmm. That is a very moving very and very sad, painful letter to uh, listen to. You can really uh, tell the feelings and the, uh, the, the trials and tribulations that she's had to go through. Thank God she has Melissa, too. Melissa. Yes, very much so. Beautiful, smart girl, and, um, and it's, just, it's, it's such a beautiful thing. It's, it really is to see them together. Really, that was quite moving good one uh, I just want to let everybody know I just got a message from Mara she's actually listening to the live show right now and she'll be calling us at about 10 minutes or so awesome that's great really. so Jamie let's get some of your story in here while we got a chance I mean um, have you always been in upstate New York 
Uh, well, Central New York is where I grew up. And we moved to upstate New York about six years ago. Okay, and you were you were born male, and you transitioned to three, female, right? Correct. At at what age? Um, well, the first attempt was right around 23, 22, 23. And then I met my ex-wife, and um, we were married for like 10, well, 10, 11 years. And uh, basically I got to the point where, just like the letter said, I just, I knew that I wouldn't be around if I didn't transition. So um, I transitioned, I'm 39 now, about two and a half years ago. So, so you basically, you always felt like you were a woman born in a man's body. Oh, definitely, definitely. Some of my earliest memories. Well, you know, I think it's pretty awesome that option is available nowadays so that people can feel fulfill it, you know. it's. Uh, oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, I remember when I was a kid and I first realized that uh, a sex reassignment surgery, surgery was available, I can remember the euphoria that I felt just knowing that I had that option. You know, so I was so excited. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I you know, I, I mean, and I, anytime I think about this topic, you know, and I probably just my s twisted mind, I just think of things weird. Okay. But I also think about the intersex, you know, where they actually get their gender chosen for them sometimes at birth. And they make mistakes sometimes, you know, so it kind of falls into the same category where later in life they have to, uh, you know, transfer their, their gender, you know, back to what it should have been in the first place, you know. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Can, can you uh, tell us a little bit, without getting all uh, graphic detailed, uh, can you tell us a little bit what the, your transition was like? Because sometimes it's different from person to person. Um, honestly, my transition was pretty easy. I had um, I had the support of my family when I first started, and my wife's family, of all people, actually supported me very well and still do to this day. Um, most of my friends knew from before, um, and those who didn't were a little shocked when I told them, but I haven't really lost any friends. Um, so my, my transition was, like I said, really, really easy for the most part. Um, and, I mean, currently I'm not talking to my parents because um, my father passed away and I wasn't invited to the funeral. Wow. Um, because they were, they were afraid I was going to embarrass them. Hmm. So there's, oh. there's, there's some bad things in there, but I have a lot of support. Well, that, that's really good to know because, uh, you know, there, there are transgender folks out there that don't have that sort of support, that, you know, real concrete support network. And it's, right. important, it's important that they know that there are people out here that do care about them and do want to see them succeed. Yes. Like everybody, just everybody should be succeeding. You know, we are, you know, we are... If we become who we are, or if we become who, you know, that we know in our hearts who we are, I mean, it, it, it's it's us that have to make that decision, and you know, right. that's why everything should be equal, you know, because you know, it's not affecting anybody else; it's affecting me. Whether I'm this and I want to transfer, trans, um, trans, you know, transition into something else, that's what I'm feeling. That's what's going to make me happy, you know, and you know, it's just, everything should be equal. Visitation, you know, it all goes back to that equality. Well, well and by the same token, it's important that you have a good support network too, because these issues are very difficult for anybody to deal with, let alone the person that's actually going through it. Yeah. Uh, it's you know that person needs all the support and love and care that they can get. Yes, I agree with that definitely, and. You know, I mean, I, I found a lot of support online uh, through online support groups. Uh, Facebook has quite a few uh, transgender groups and a lot of loving people there that are that are willing to help people and give people advice. All right, for Facebook, go. Yes, <laughs> I, I think I'll, that deserves some applause. Oh, I knew he was going to say that. One moment, please. <laughs> <laughs> 
Feel better now? <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to brighten the mood, my friends. <laughs> Uh, so so Jamie, so you so you transitioned and then you um you, you said you married and, and I'm guessing that didn't happen in New York, huh? Uh no, no, actually it did happen in New York. Um I had started to transition when I was like I said when I was 21 or 22 and I met this woman that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with and <clears throat> I stopped. I went I went back to being male. Uh for her and we had three children, three beautiful children. And then one day she just, you know, couldn't deal with it anymore, I guess. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd always been honest with her because I believe honesty is always the best policy. Um, so she knew right from the beginning. But uh, she just she couldn't uh, accept the fact anymore that I was transgendered and that I wanted to transition. Um, so she, she moved back down to Syracuse. And I got custody of my three beautiful children. So, wow, that's I bet wow. that in itself is a story. Yes, it definitely is. It's it's, it's a new uh, <laughs> a new chapter in my life, and it's definitely a learning experience. But I mean, the fact that you got custody when you and you were transitioning, and you got custody, or that yeah. you got custody before you started transitioning. No, no, no. I got custody after transition. Wow. Um, it, it, didn't, it really didn't go through the court systems. It was more of a mutual agreement between her and I. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, okay. Um, but, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I was just able to give them a better life. Well, that's awesome. That is awesome. May, if, if I may ask a question, uh, how, how did, did, are your children old enough to understand what's what's happening for you? or? Uh, two of them are. My son just turned nine today, so happy birthday. And uh, oh. one of my daughters is five years old, and then my youngest daughter is three. Oh, okay, nice. And uh, I've, I've been very open with them from the second I decided I was going to transition. I brought them into the other room and, you know, explained to them what was going to happen. And I got a big hug and said, you know, and I got, my son told me that they'd love me no matter what. That's you know, awesome. And, yeah, like I said, I got a lot of family support, um, my immediate family, my, my children. Um, but he also saw the the dark cloud just lift the second I decided I was going to transition and make this my new life um, and kind of fluff off the old life. He, he saw a complete turnaround in my personality. I mean, I was smiling, which was something new for me. And, uh, you know, he really liked it. And he, he saw that it just by looking at me that it was the best choice. So that's why he supports it. Funny. That's awesome. For that's someone funny. so young to be so supportive of his his uh, family is just uh, an awesome, awesome thing. Well, I think that's the way kids are. It doesn't. They, I bet they, they didn't even blink twice about it, you know? I mean, it was just, you know? I, there's definitely something to do with the younger. Uh, they're more accepting younger children are uh, you don't really have to explain as much to them they accept things as face value it's, it's when I think it's when they get older mm -hmm. and I hate to blame society or whatever but mm -hmm. the, the social morals exactly. are placed on them exactly and then, then they get to you know they don't think for themselves they start to think more along the lines of society yeah after they become indoctrinated yeah or brainwashed as the case may be <laughs> Terrible. So, but, but right now, legally, uh, on your identification cards, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you're classified as female. No, not yet. I haven't got to that point yet. Oh. Uh, everything else, everything else, basically is. Uh, I go for pick up prescriptions under under Janie. Um, but I haven't gotten because up in St. Lawrence County, it's a little more difficult. They're not as accepting. And they have to go through that whole uh, uh, printing it in the papers for like six months or something before they'll give me a name change. And it just, I guess maybe I'm a little different this way, but I'm happy with myself, so it doesn't matter what my driver's license says. Right. 
at this point. Eventually, yes, it will be it will be an important thing. Um, but at this point, I mean, it's more important for me to be happy and comfortable with myself, be able to look in the mirror and say, hey, that's me. Because for the first 37 years of my life, I wasn't able to do that. I would look in the mirror and feel like there's a stranger staring back at me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. God, that's got to be a weird feeling. It is totally a weird feeling. <laughs> <laughs> and you just you, you can't accept what you're looking at. It just doesn't look right. It's kind of like putting a mask over your face and looking at yourself in the mirror. Right, right. You know it's you, but it doesn't look like you. I'm not sure how I would be able to handle that. I think I'd probably uh, be uh, in a very difficult state of mind. (laughs) It's very depressing. It really is. Okay, folks, it looks like we've got Mara calling in. One moment while I add her to the conference call with us. All right. Hello, Mara. We got you in there. Hey, Tom. How are you? Should I turn off my volume on the radio now? Um, let's see if we're hearing it. I don't notice it in the background, so it doesn't matter. All right. Good good morning, Mara. Good morning. This is Cal. Uh, this is Kali from Hawaii. Well, hello. This is Aloha. Mara from. I'm calling you from the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> it's still morning here. <laughs> I bet so. That's hey, so well. it's, it's, it's Rob. Uh, Cisco is not here yet, but it's Rob um, and Cisco uh, from New York City. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderfully, thank you. Great, great. And Jamie's in there with us also. She's from Upstate. You probably you've been listening to the live, so you've been hearing what Jamie's been saying. Of course, I'm Tom. Hello. Uh, let's see, Mara, goodness gracious, let me find my little notes on you here, because, I mean, goodness gracious, you, you are the founding of... Uh-oh. 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 Jamie. Uh-oh. We have an emergency on Jamie's location. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> I apologize for that. That's okay. That's okay. That's family life right there at, at its finest. You've got to stop beating those children. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> I'm not doing that. My three-year-old is my five-year-old. <laughs> so Mara is the founding executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality, uh, the founding executive director. That's a pretty awesome statement, Mara. We thank you for coming and spending some time with us. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Tom. I'm very excited to be on. Oh, and I mean, how, so how long have you been working in transgender equality? Probably about 12 years now. And uh, I've been uh, at the National Center for Transgender Equality since its founding in 2003. Uh, and before that, I was uh, doing activism from my home at the time of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Wow. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm very lucky I get to do this work. Oh, goodness. Yeah, well, I, I think the community is probably lucky to have you do the work, too. <laughs> you know? Well, thank you. That's very sweet. Very sweet. So what would you like to talk about? Well, we're just going to try to cover the the whole thing we're trying to educate the world you know i mean uh yeah yeah they need to know things and they need to understand things and they need to start realizing that some of the things they say can kind of sound like they're coming from ignorance and i've been guilty of that myself so we're, that's what we're looking for to kind of you know <laughs> spread a little bit of the love here and let everybody know we're we're all the same you know and all these labels and names and everything just cause division and uh, but we need to be respectful, and I think wording and what comes out of our mouths can 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 uh, wreck that really easy. I think that's right. I think that's great. Well, education is what it's all about, so I'm here to help. Well, I think it would be a, a, a good uh, point here to uh, 
see what uh, Mara's thoughts are on some of the things that I brought up at the top of the show. Uh, the uh, Edna has been introduced into the house by Representative Barney Frank, and I would like to get your thoughts on that. All right, sure, absolutely. Well, so the Employment Non-Discrimination Act is um, uh, has really, over the last bunch of years, become the cornerstone of the LGBT and the transgender <coughs> federal agenda. Um, it's just a really simple. Um, piece of legislation which, when it's eventually passed, will protect um, people's jobs. It will make it illegal to um, not hire people or to fire people or to not promote people, etc., um, based on their sexual orientation or their gender identity. And um, it's, you know, we've been trying to get this passed since, you know, forever, but uh, in, in its current form since 2006 when gender identity was added. But before that, with just sexual orientation since the mid-90s, before that, since the mid-70s, when there was a broader, what was called a gay civil rights bill. Um, and, you know, now it's going full circle. A lot of us are advocating for a broader civil rights bill now, while at the same time still working on the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. And I I don't think I'd want to predict yet which one will pass first, Uh a separate bill like ENDA or a broader civil rights bill. But what it is about this year, since honestly the House of Representatives in Congress is probably not going to pass this, this this Congress. So until 2013, what we're all doing is working um, really hard to educate all the new members of Congress and, and any older members of Congress who are a little skittish for whatever reason. And we're just going to use these two years to educate, educate, educate. So as soon as we have a friendly Congress again, we can get this passed and save people's jobs. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Now, that's an awesome statement there. And doesn't ENDA also protect women in general for, for play, equal pay? No. Women, uh, women were protected, have been protected actually with a series of, of civil rights laws. Um, in particular relating to jobs, Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, but, but then there have been other, um, as, as employers and, and the government and others have tried to get around it, there have had to be new laws to tighten it up here and there, and there's a couple of um, fair wage issues still uh, left to go on women, but in general, uh, and it would just be sexual orientation and gender identity as opposed to gender. And is there any websites or anything our listeners can uh, visit to get uh, or to see the bill in its current form? Well, technically, uh, you know, there's there's been a little technical uh, misunderstanding this week. Uh, all of us, including me, by the way, keep saying that ENDA was introduced. Technically, it's not going to be introduced until sometime this week, I understand. It, it has been announced, and um, Congressman Frank and, and our other congressional allies are working really hard, uh, as are a lot of our organizations in D.C., to beef up the number of um, co-sponsors in Congress of the bill. And it will technically be introduced sometime very shortly, in the next week or so. And at that time, people can go look, up, look it up um, on the Library of Congress site called Thomas, like the man's name, thomas.loc.gov, and LOC stands for Library of Congress. And you can just look under, uh, you know, just type in the Employment Knowledge Commission Act and you'll find it. But I also think most of the national LGBT groups will have it, have it linked on their websites. I know we will. Yeah, a lot of sites. Yeah, uh, in case I didn't mention it yet, Mar has a couple websites, uh, but the primary one being transequality.org. Got to get that out there. That's important. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Let's That's right. And, and, you know, it's... Well, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tom. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go right ahead. Well, so I, you know, I've been listening, and, and I, I am... I'm always so excited to be on shows like this because uh, I, I think that the, the local work that people are doing, and this is a this is more than a local work. I know this particular show um, is, 
is really national in scope. But the work that individuals are doing, you know, whether it's the folks here on the show or the folks listening, is just so, so much more potent than anything those of us in Washington, D.C. are ever going to be able to do. Um, it, it really just reaches people and does the education that Tom was talking about earlier. And that's how we're all progressing. And that's what's teaching people um, about our lives and, and about how to be decent people to us. So I, I just thank everybody who's you know, part of the show and, and everybody who's listening who's, who's doing other cool stuff you know, back in their hometown. Yeah, yeah, it takes the more the more the merrier in that boat. That's for sure. That <laughs> that's right. <laughs> let's shift gears. Let's move on to uh, um, uh, violence against the transgender community, um, <coughs> because we all know, you know, of course, all of us in the LGBT community fear that. But I think the transgender community seems to get more than their fair share of it, and often some of the most violent crime against them. Yeah, it's, um, it, it is one of the most horrible um, parts of of all of our work, um, and you know, for a lot of folks, the hardest thing they have to face every day is you know that when they know if they go out, um, they they could always have targets painted on their back, and um, um, you know, a lot of it is tied to. The stigma of being an LGBT person, a lot of it is tied even to things that we don't expect, like the really bad economy. You know, as the economy gets bad, people look for people to blame. And um, that can make it worse for LGBT people. But the, um, you know, not being able to have a job means you're likely to live in a less safe place. You're likely to have to be engaged in activities that are a little less safe. Um, and uh, it can be just catastrophic for trans people. Yeah. yeah, it compounds that way. I didn't even think about that before. Huh. Oh, yeah. Well, it w when I had suggested this topic last week, it was... Uh, uh, our last our last roundtable show. I uh, I was hoping that uh, we could use it as a, t a point of education for the community at large to show them that these issues are very real and what they can what they can do in their own communities to help some tra help the transgender community uh, feel a little bit more safer and feel like they. Um, Ha have a place where they can turn. I, uh, so m maybe we can not only discuss the violence against the trans community, but perhaps uh, we might want to talk about some things that we can do as a community to uh, not only promote awareness of trans uh, community issues, but things that we can do uh, to help the trans community. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Are, are you asking me or the whole round table? Uh, uh, well, if you would like to take that question, I'd be honored to uh, hear your answer. Well, I'd also be honored to hear the answers of everybody else, too. So whatever <laughs> you'd like. Go ahead, Mara. We'll let you top it. Well, great. Well, um, you know, the, the, LG, the, the, the gay agenda, the gay political agenda, really is... Um, largely overlapping with the trans political agenda. So the work that um, gay activists are doing almost always benefits um, trans people too. Um, but there's a lot of things on the trans agenda that are that are um, are, are more trans specific. Uh, and, and Jamie talked a little bit about the identification documentation issues that we have. I think we have some some different and heightened health access issues than, than a lot of gay people have. Yeah. And I, I think why I point that out in terms of how gay people can help is, I, I think, and it's also how trans people can help gay people, is we all have to understand that, A, we have similar agendas, um, not perfectly overlapping, but largely overlapping, and we have to, we really have to fight for each other. And we've always shared the same friends, the same enemies, the same safe space, the same culture. 
And so if, if any of us are weaker, we're all weaker, and all of us are stronger when all of us are stronger. So trans people supporting gay people and gay people supporting trans people is just really important, making sure that our safe spaces are safe for all of us. Um, and that's not just a trans versus gay thing, but also thinking about it in terms of um, different ages and different races and different classes. Um, you know, safe space is still so important for all LGBT people. And then making sure our agendas advance and advance together and advance as quick as we can. And then just just making sure we just stand up for each other in one-on-one -on -one circumstances. When, you know, somebody tells a, a fag joke, trans people should stand up. And when somebody tells a tranny joke, gay people should stand up. And, uh, and so those are some of my ideas. Yeah, I totally agree, for sure. That's, uh, I, you know, one of my big things at the end of every show, I say we're all one human family, you know, and uh, Rob and Cisco are real big on trying to toss the labels, you know, because that's all, this, all these different tools and instruments of division that we have in our society, uh, just they're, they're, they abound. Well, there's way too many, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's even so many. There's even so many um, different, um, like like I was saying earlier, in the umbrella of transgender. There's just there's so many. There's cross dressing. There's transvestitism. There's drag queens, drag kings. And, you know, the, we have all these labels, and it's just like we're just we are who we are. And accept us for who we are. Well, like I often tell people, uh, you know, being gay is just a small part of who I am. It's not, it's not my entire makeup, and I, I think that, uh, you know, we need. I do agree with Rob and Cisco. We do need to sort of toss the labels because, uh, you know, after all, it's just a small, tiny part of who we are, especially uh, when it comes to, you know acting like a family and standing up for each other um, because in my experience and you know I, I'll admit my experience is very very limited in this area uh, I, I don't see a whole lot of support in the gay community for our trans brothers and sisters and I, I think that's uh, I think that's something that's completely wrong and you know we are a family you know, within our own community and we need to start acting like it yeah, I agree. I think in a lot, in some people in the community, the uh, T in LGBT is like a redheaded stepchild. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. It, it really feels that way. So many just don't. I mean, I, I'll never forget when you know when they took it out. Wasn't it Enda where they removed the uh, trans previously when they submitted the bill when Barney Frank and HRC got together and took the, threw the trans people under the bus? You know, and I was like. How rude, you know, that that's that, that's just not right, you know. And yeah. all kinds of people were saying, well, isn't it better that some of us get protection, you know? And I'm going, no, it's not, you know. It's supposed to be all for one and one for all, last I looked, you know. Goodness. Well, I, 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 hear, I hear all that, and I think that's really important, and, and that's a good position for us all to have, and, and I hope we can strengthen that, but, but I, I don't want to make it sound like um, there's not gay support for trans people. A lot of the best trans work going on right now is um, from a lot of, of national and state and local LGBT efforts. Um, you know, it's, uh, there are a lot of really great people, a lot of great trans activists work for, for LGBT groups, and um, and when the ENDA problem happened in 2007, 300 groups got together and stood together um, to, to protect trans people. So um, I, I think there's always room for improvement, but I don't want to make it sound like, uh, you know, and just look at this show. You know, this show is, you know, primarily a, a gay-oriented show, um, and you guys are being fabulously supportive, and um, I think we have to... We have to acknowledge that, and remember it, and, and honor it. Yeah, that's true. So thank well, you. Well, you're quite welcome because I, I, 
that's around here we kind of yeah all for one one for all one big human family and i think you know that that's that's the that what i call the magic key you know is, is love you know and then yeah you know if that's all we do if that's the only thing that people can only remember one thing if you could just remember those four letters you know it could change the world you know I mean, <laughs> yeah now i i think all that being said there there still have to be more trans efforts and there's some there's some really great things going on that are that are more trans and and, and gender specific um that are are really cropping up all over the country that, that are really just wonderful. There are some economic development programs in a lot of cities around the country. There, um, in, you know, in Seattle, there have been really great efforts around ID documentation, around um, prison reform specific to helping trans people. Um, you know, there's, there's cities like Chicago where there's a zillion little programs of various sorts, just real grassrootsy things. Um, like, uh, you know, there's a gender queer group in Chicago that's doing great work. There's the Video Action League. There's just amazing efforts just uh, almost in every big city now. And we have to figure out how not to leave people who aren't in big cities behind. Uh, it's a lot harder to organize in uh, probably in St. Lawrence County, huh, Jamie? Yes, definitely. <laughs> Um, I, I have yet to actually meet a transgender person up here. <laughs> wow. Wow. Oh, wow. I, I know there's yeah. one because my doctor mentioned it, but I think I'm the only one for the most part. <laughs> yeah. There's two others who live within 100 yards of my apartment. <laughs> so so what, what, is, what is your advice for reaching trans community members in, say, like, middle America? What, how, how do we go about letting them know that they are not alone and that they are, you know, places that they can go? Well, we, I think in all of our organizing efforts, we should be open and, and look for ways to do that. Uh, I shouldn't say all of our organizing efforts because some of the best organizing efforts, even in big cities, are necessarily very local. Um, and, you know, somebody in, you know, Brooklyn, uh, you know, doing a organizing thing, may, it may not be appropriate. And it may be, and if it is, they should. But we need to look at better ways to use the Internet, but, but not just rely on the Internet. The Internet is still not a personal, you know, touchy-feely kind of thing. And, you know, more and more the Internet is, is a, you know, can, can be a fairly hostile place. But we have to think about that. And, and well, can I tell you a story about a mouse, a couple of mice who died and go to heaven? Oh, yes, this yes. Is, this is actually a very relevant story. So these these mice die and go to heaven. And, and um, in this story, it's, you know, Christian heaven. So St. Peter's at the gates, and he lets them in. He says, hey, mice, you've lived good lives. Here's your house. And, and you get to eat all you want. Just go hang out and go have fun. So he sees them a couple weeks later, and he says, how's it going? And they say, it's great. The weather's beautiful. We have everything we need. But we just have one problem. It's so big, and we can't, we can't get around very well because we have these tiny little mouse legs. And we were thinking, and Team Pierce says, don't say anything else. I know exactly what to do. Here's some roller skates. And he gives the mice roller skates, and he sends them on their way doesn't even hear their suggestions. And a couple weeks later, a cat dies and comes up to heaven, and St. Peter gives the cat a cat house, and not a cat house in the cat house sense, <laughs> just a house to live in. And, um, and he sends the cat on his way with the same kind of instructions. He sees the cat a couple weeks later, and he says, how's it going? He says, oh, my God, the weather's so beautiful, and I really, really like the Meals on Wheels program. <laughs> the, the point of the story, as silly as it may sound, is that if if you let other people come up with your solutions for you, even if they mean well, you might get eaten. <laughs> and I think the most important thing for all the different types of, of LGBT people, all the different types of trans people, and rural and urban and 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 black and immigrant and and young and old is we can't try we can't be trying to find one solution that fits for everybody 
we have to involve as many different kinds of people and as many individual people in their own liberation and, and in creating their own solutions. And, and that's really hard to do. And, you know, honestly, nobody's ever figured out how to do it perfectly. Um, but we have to do it as well as we can. Uh, you know, having somebody, you know, like me who does federal policy coming up with solutions for somebody who, you know, is just trying to find a job in a really rural county in North Dakota, um, you know, I might not come up with the right thing for that person. So we have to figure out how to get more people involved um, and more people telling us what they need and how they think their solutions should look. And since you're on the federal level, and I kind of wanted to shift gears here a little bit into immigration issues, because I, I thought I read recently that the immigration changed the passports now so that the gender could be accurately uh, represented on the passport. So, yeah, I'd love to hear more about that immigration stuff. Well, sure. You know, we, we live in a country where having accurate and consistent ID is becoming more and more important. And remember, passports and ID aren't just for traveling, and they aren't just for, you know, driving and getting pulled over by the police. You need good ID to get a job. You need good ID to open a bank account. You need good ID to buy a beer, um, to enroll your child in school. So we, we really need to have good ID. And it's been very, very hard for trans people to have it. So somebody like me who has transitioned from male to female might still have mail on some of my ID. Um, you know, Medicare cards for seniors have their gender marker on, on the, right on the card. So every time a senior goes to the drugstore to pick up drugs or goes to the doctor and checks in with the receptionist, they, they may have to out themselves as trans. And that's fine in some places and for some people, but in a lot of places that can be really dangerous. Uh, economically or physically. So we went to the State Department and asked them to um, make it a little more reasonable for trans people to change the gender marker on their passports. The, previously, the, the standard had been you had to prove you have had genital surgery, and that's just not a viable standard for a lot of trans people. Um, surgery can be extremely expensive. Um, some people may have a medical contraindication that disallows them from getting surgery. Um, some people may have a religious issue with it, and some people may just not want it. Um, so, but you know, the, the, you know, a big primary cause is the cost. And so we went to them, and the passport agency updated their policy um, following you know current medical standards, which are uh, which you now have to get a doctor to say that uh, you have had appropriate treatment for you, according to the doctor, which still means the trans person has to be able to afford a doctor. Mm -hmm. um, it's still not the ideal policy, um, but it's, it is much more updated. It's what the medical community thinks it should be. Um, and it, it is now so that almost any trans person can get a good passport now. And that's the gold standard of ID, so that's, that's a really big, important deal. Yeah, that's huge. That's huge. Because <laughs> I, I was, you know. So, so basically, uh, but they had to. I mean, where's the? It's does it depend on the doctor? Where do they draw the line? What I mean, if if the doctor, I guess the doctor patient. Um, uh, relationship is kind of important there, depending on when the doctor would actually. I mean, I don't know. It sounds confusing that the doctors somehow, uh, like, they got to draw a line somewhere. You know, I mean, the doctors obviously, if, if they're doing this kind of stuff, are, are kind of not combative. So I guess they just kind of go along with the, if, if they've had a partial uh, of the surgery or whatever, then that's, that's if they've had any, if they're taking the uh, hormones, then, then that's good to go, right? Basically is where they're stopping at. Well, it's between the patient and the doctor, and um, it, it, it's about transition. It's not about some, uh, I think there's a misunderstanding among the general public that having genital surgery is what being a transgender person is about. Mm -hmm. You are transgender. Your, your gender identity 
is a real core component of your your being and the surgery is for for most people what confirms that and what has to come into um comportment with that um but it isn't what makes you trans it isn't what makes you male or female um and just because you're um you know just because you can't afford tens of thousands of dollars for surgery doesn't mean you're not male or female um just as you know just because you haven't found the right um person to be attracted to doesn't mean you're not straight or gay i'm not sure that's a perfect analogy there but um so if 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 my doctor says that i have transitioned and i should have id that says i'm female um that should be good enough for the federal government and it is now and 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 the interesting thing that that i an intellectually interesting thing to me is there's no interest that the federal government has to do it any other way uh what interest would the federal government or the state department or whomever have um in having a an m uh, for male on my passport there's there's no advantage to anybody mm-hmm. um whether i've had surgery or not um if i'm living full time as a female it's actually in the government's interest that i have a female on my passport yeah i would think yeah you know that could be a, a costly you know overhead oversight you know i mean cuz that could yeah you spend a lot of hours and time of people on an on a non issue <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know? I mean, it costs money. You know. I mean, we got to talk. You know, it's always got to come down to money, right? It doesn't doesn't matter what people feel or what they are. It always got to right. come back to money. You know? Right. Well, yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, if I could just give a shout out to the Obama administration, not that they care what I think, but we are seeing phenomenal work being done now. Um there's a lot of great activists in DC and around the country, you know, advocating with the federal government. But there are a lot of folks in the federal government who really want to do the right thing and you know, we've seen this week some phenomenal stuff happening, particularly around healthcare and I think you're going to see some more great healthcare stuff in the next couple of weeks. But you know, the Health and Human Services Department uh was was required by the president a year ago when he issued his hospital visitation rule he mentioned in his uh directive in paragraph 3 that um he wanted a list of all of the other stuff that health and human services could do to to improve LGBT people's health and yesterday secretary sebelius released a list of things and it's um it's it's really remarkable um one thing is they now told every um uh, employee of health and human services that every program from of the department needs to be implemented in a way that doesn't discriminate um based on sexual orientation and gender identity that's a really really huge advancement that's huge, and yeah. um the day before that on Thursday uh, a study that health and human services contracted with the institute of medicine came out and basically said there's there needs to be sexual orientation and gender identity questions in every federal health study. Um that's really huge because we can't we can't solve the problems until we know what the problems are and how bad they are and until you get into government surveys it's really hard to prove there's a real problem. Mm-hmm. You know the survey we did at at NCTE along with the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force shows that 41% of all the tra- all 6500 trans people in our study had attempted suicide. But wow. until the government study says that, the government doesn't try to solve the problem. So all of this stuff that Health and Human Services is doing is huge, huge, huge and it just shows that there is a real commitment uh of the Obama administration to do these kind of things you know not for political purposes believe me if we could get them to do stuff for political reasons that would be great <laughs> but, but we can <laughs> they, they 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 do you know the, the department of health and human services human services does what they think is right for health and they're really coming through for us well 
Well, and it looks like they're coming through on the on the for the world too, because I mean, there's been a, a 180 degree turnaround in the United Nations compared to the last administration. And uh, what what are they doing good things there too? Oh, there's a bunch of stuff going on. Um, I, you know, when when Congressman Frank introduced Enda on Wednesday. He also mentioned that he got the Financial Services Committee, which he's the ranking Democrat, to um, send a letter to Treasury Secretary Geithner asking that no money, uh, that, that the federal government fight any money from the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and places like that, going to places that discriminate, uh, that uh, cause violence and, and um, uh, persecute LGBT people. Um, and, by the way, people because of their religion. That's something that was also important to Congressman Frank. Um, but the, the State Department now includes sexual orientation and gender identity in all of their human rights reports that they do on every single country in the world. So now that the, the United States government is now assessing the human rights against LGBT people um, in every country in the world, except the United States, by the way. We don't assess our own human rights, which I think is a fairly big shortcoming. I, I agree with that because, you know, lately <laughs> we, we could definitely use more help in that area in this country, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so there's, there's just a lot of stuff going on. And, you know, the United States is a very, very important player in, in human rights worldwide. And we need, we need our government to do that um, honorably and morally and and with us in mind. Yeah, because they sure weren't doing it in the previous administration. They were doing the exact opposite, it seemed, fighting against anything that was positive for our community. So, yeah, that's it. It needs to turn around because there's, I mean, the abuses we face in our country are, are nothing compared to some others. But I, I also think that, you know, this, uh, we should start at home first, you know. Right. What? Well, and I tend to agree, but, uh, you know, we, we really do, uh, on so many different issues, not just our own, uh, we do need to start here at home and stop uh, getting into the other countries' affairs before we can have ours uh, to a good working order. Let's see. Rob, you still with us, Rob? I am still here. Somebody else has joined us, too. He's... This guy here. Cisco got back home. Yes, he wow. did. Wow. Fashionably late again. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Fashionably. everyone. Fashionably Hello. late. Aloha. That's drag queen time, man. You're an hour late. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm just feeling a little under the weather, so. Uh... <laughs> well, we're glad to have you. Glad you made it. Better late than never. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, how is everything going? Well, we're going doing good. You got y'all got any uh, input or questions for Mara or Jamie? Yeah, well, let me Jamie. just take off my jacket and get comfortable. <laughs> oh, oh, he literally, literally just walked in the door. Yeah, literally just walked in. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Oh, goodness. Let me read a quick little note. I got a, uh, uh, from, I just got off the internet from queerpublicradio.com a little. A uh, note, a message uh, from a person that goes by the name of Noah, I believe, is in the chat room right now on QueerPublicRadio.com. And the message that Noah wrote is, I was listening to your show, and I just wanted to share an experience of mine with my mom and my identity. I'm a 22-year-old genderqueer trans guy. I just found two days ago uh, on our shared computer an untitled document. I opened it out of curiosity and was horrified at what was written in it. It said, please make my daughter a woman again, not a lesbian. Make her a pure woman as she was born, not a man. I am praying for her to be a woman again. Please help her. She is my only daughter. Noah continues, I checked when it was written. Uh, which was less than two weeks prior to my finding it. My mom and I hadn't talked about my trans identity since a week after she forced me out, which was September 30th. She has been digging through my notes and such and saw that I wanted to legally change my name and was thinking about changing my gender marker on my ID. 
and had asked if I was gay. I said, no, that I was trans, and she had no idea what that meant. I told her, and she got really upset. She said a bunch of terrible things, which uh, that this shared on, she evidently shared on a blog spot post. Hopefully, she'll put the link in the chat. Uh, he said that uh, mother said that she should, he should be taking shouldn't be taking testosterone and should be taking estrogen instead uh, to make him a girl and that he should go through regression therapy. Uh, that's the summary of what he wanted to share with us. Wow. Uh, he, he did add, uh, I'm sorry, he did add on the end one more sentence. He says, since then he has found refuge in his uh, queer family, friends of his, and have continued uh, to be the happiest he's ever been. So he's, he's going from female to male? Yes. Wow. And the, the parents seem to be the hardest, uh, the, not always, but they seem to be the hardest, or especially if they're from a very religious background. They seem to take, well, I think anybody, it, it's, everybody seems to take it in hard, but, um, they don't realize how hard the person that has been struggling in the body that they, they weren't meant to be in, um, they don't realize how long they've been struggling themselves. Um, so, you know, you know, yeah, you've got to struggle with it, but the one who's the one who's doing the transition, they've been struggling it with for a while because they were born into the wrong body. It's a sad thing. Yeah, I I um I know Noah, as a matter of fact. Um, and because this is the 21st century, um, Noah and I have actually communicated today on Facebook. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm so sorry Noah's was going through that. And um, a couple things I want to say about it is, you know, sometimes it's hard initially for, for parents and friends. Sometimes they don't know very much. Um, and, you know, how they feel today isn't necessarily how they'll feel tomorrow. Um, and, you know, sounds like a little more education is needed there, but I just want to give a, a shout out to Noah also, you know, who, while going through that, is still doing really, really great work for others. Um, and and that's, that's been a hallmark, uh, something that showed up in our survey over and over again. As bad as the numbers were across the board, people were so resilient and still really interested in working to help others. And and so so Noah, thank you for everything you're doing, and 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 stay strong on the home front. Um, and, and, and you know, there's people out there that love you. And I was just going to add that uh, no, there are those of us out here that care about you and want to see you succeed. And uh, you know, you you hold on to your your friends there because uh, you know sometimes our friends are our most important. Uh, allies in our struggles to continue to live our lives in an open and honest fashion. Yeah, I think so many of us in the LGBT community have definitely experienced that finding the family or re, re, reassigning our family probably would be more accurate, you know, in, in, <laughs> into other community members. <laughs> I, I think you're right there, Tom. A lot of us, uh, no matter uh, what label you want to put on us, uh, we we do tend to kind of uh, go with our, you know, gay brothers and sisters and our trans brothers and sisters and look to them as our as our quote unquote family. Um, a lot of us have had trouble, you know, within our own families, whether it's uh, trans issues or gay issues or lesbian issues or whatever the issue is. Uh, a lot of us have had trouble with our families because, you know, we also have to remember our families come from a different generation. And a lot of these uh, issues that we are seeing and dealing with the, today, they didn't, you know, that sex back then wasn't something that they even talked about you know, let alone, you know, any other of these issues. So uh, I applaud Noah for uh, being uh, br brave enough to come out and uh, talk with us today, and I, I hope that he uh, finds a way to motivate himself to stick with his gay, gay GLBT family and uh, know that we are out here to support him. 
Yeah. That is not a lunch either. What was that you, Cisco? Nope. <laughs> I said that he's not alone. <laughs> Jamie, I think I think your your child wants to be a DJ. <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you didn't hear that. <laughs> What, what you don't know, Jamie, is your child is actually also online writing us notes. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't doubt that. She's smart enough. Oh, my goodness. She's definitely a handful. Well, when she gets the English language down real good, let me know. We'll, we'll give her a show slot. <laughs> <laughs> that would be an interesting show. Yeah. I can only imagine what what that would be about. <laughs> Uh, Mara, I know you didn't have a whole lot of time with us today, and I don't want to take up too much of your time. So uh, yeah, at this point, I'll, I'll you know throw the uh, the podium to you, and and in case uh, whatever you want to say, and in, in, in case you got to go, the podium is yours. Well, I I'm so thankful, Tom, that you you've had me on today. It's it's been wonderful. Um, I'm uh, I'm so sorry to hear that uh, my brother Noah is going through that, but. Um, Let's stay strong, but I just, I guess what I'd want everybody to know is we really are at a, a really critical moment now on trans rights, on LGBT rights, and what we need is everybody doing everything, and we need people to, to come out, to step out, to step up, and do the education. You, you don't have to be... You know, you don't have to be doing the, the work that I'm doing or that the other people are doing. You have to be doing the work that you see is important, that you're called to do, um, that you're amazed by, and then you're amazing, and, and we're going to win. And um, I want everybody to start thinking about what they're for, not what they're against. I don't care anymore why, you know, how we got to this point or who's doing what to us. I just want to know what are we going to do to step up and get it fixed. And um, I'm working, NCTE is working our butts off. A lot of people are working their butts off, and we could really use help from all from everybody. So, you know, do what do what you can do to to make life better for everybody. You know, have a radio show like Tom. It's a really <laughs> big deal. You know, it really helps a lot. Oh, thanks, Mara. I thank you. It's people like you that make it. You know, that's uh, awesome. People like you to take a little bit of time out of your busy schedule because I know you got a lot on your plate, and I thank you. And I'm not trying to run you off. You're welcome to stay for the entirety <laughs> of the show if you want. <laughs> you know, if, if, if I may just interject, you know, it, it's it's people like Mara and the, the rest of the uh, her colleagues there uh, that are doing some really important work because uh, you know, like myself, I don't think I could handle life there in Washington because I know I. I would be telling some folks off, but uh, so I want to say uh, thank you so much for your hard work there in Washington, and uh, let's let's all keep up the good fight. Yeah, well, I just I, I thank you for that. I, I do want to point out though that sometimes we need people telling people off. Um, that is and, true. You know, as as the movement has become more and more professionalized, we haven't had to yell in the streets only. But we've forgotten that sometimes we have to yell in the streets. And I don't think, and I mean this, I mean this from the bottom of my heart, the, the work that a lot of us are doing here in Washington or in state capitals around the country, I know it's really important. I really believe in it. It is not one whit more important than people educating their families, than people educating their schools, than people standing up for their friends, than people working at HIV service organizations, than, than people doing support groups. It, it is all work that has to get done, that people desperately need, and I'm, I'm so proud of anybody who's doing any of it. Yeah, it takes all of us. We all just have to keep putting one foot in front of the other, and sooner or later, That's you right. know, a little bit by little bit, it just sometimes feels like it happens so slow. You know, I, the first women's 
Conference in the United States, the Women's Rights Conference in the United States was in 1848 in Seneca Falls, New York. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony did it. And, well, I guess, well, Susan B. Anthony after a minute. But anyway, it was 70 years before they won the right to vote. The black civil rights movement won public accommodation protections in 1875, and then they got taken away by the courts, and they didn't get them back until 1964. We are moving at lightning speed because, A, we're all doing the work, but more importantly, all these other social justice movements have done work before us, and we can stand on their shoulders. So let's also remember we all have a lot of anti-racism work to do. We all have a lot of feminism work to do, and it really is all the same struggle. But the LGBT part of the struggle is actually moving really, really fast compared to any of the others. So since I always answer questions really, really long, I'm going to get off the phone now so you guys can have a talk. But I'm so honored that you had me on the show, and any other time you want me on, just give me a ring or drop me a line, and I'd love to be on. Okay, Mara. Thanks. Thanks. I'll let everyone else say thank you, too. Thank you, Mara. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for everything you do. Oh, you guys, too, and have a really great day. You, too, Mara. You take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye-bye. That was wonderful. And i got to remind everybody once again, her website is transequality.org. Check it out. Check out the wonderful, awesome work she's doing trying to make it a better world for all of us. Because, you know, what helps one helps all of us, you know? That's such a great thing. They, and they do some really amazing work there, too. So check it out. Also want everybody to know that, that Noah is in the chat room on QueerPublicRadio.com. Uh, and he's put a couple links in there where you can go read more of his story. Um, also, you don't have to be a member of QueerPublicRadio.com to go see the chat room and click on the links. So even if you're not a member, head on over to QueerPublicRadio.com. Uh, click on the chat button up there and go in one of the chat rooms and you'll see the links. You can click on the links and go check out more of the story that Noah had to share. I'm sure that his uh, blog posting is, is quite more extensive. And Tom, I just want to mention that uh, Noah did just put a uh, link in the chat room for Gender Queer Chicago. Uh, it's uh, www.genderqueerchicago.blogspot.com. Noah says also in the chat that he organizes for a couple of activist groups there in Chicago. So, um, yep, Noah, put all the links you want in there. Uh, that The links will remain so that people can come, even if they hear this podcast a week from now or a month from now, you know, they can come back and look in the chat room because I leave those kind of things in the chat room so they can always scroll back and, and get those links. So that's that's that will be there for you. For quite some time, you know. As of course, if we get you know a lot of chat going on, it'll kind of scroll off. But yeah, it's you're more than welcome to uh, put the links in there, whatever you want, and they'll be there for a while for people to come back in the next few weeks or whatever and and find them, so that they can go and, check and, it out. And uh, Tom, might we uh, put some of them on the links page of Queer Public Radio? Well, I might do that. You know, and Kali always has more work for me. <laughs> I'm just trying to help this young man out. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> Noah, you can do that too. You can add them in the links area. <laughs> hint, 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 hint. <laughs> I know I'm being bad now. <laughs> so, you know, I think, um, yeah. <laughs> I think I think we got to get Jamie some signs, you know, like to put over the cows, you know, some transgender equality signs, you know. To... Okay, well, they're big enough. I can just paint it on them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know the water along the paint and just kind of go around and, you know, paint a rainbow cow. That would be cool. And good quality. And... Well, that that would work. If it's those white ones, that would be way cool. I have a heart attack, but... <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, they do they watch TV and stuff? Maybe they don't know, you know? Maybe they'll just say, what a pretty rainbow. <laughs> well, there you go. That's true, too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, it depends on what kind of cows you have, too, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, you get those, what are those Jersey cows? They got the black and white spots. That could really mess you up when you got that sharp of a contrast when you start painting. Yeah, there's a the majority of those up here. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. You just have to prime them first, you know? Oh, well, you got to put primer, a primer coat. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that might kind of stand out a little bit. They, Amish, they might get upset. Sorry about the background noise. I'm going to open up jelly beans. They're going to they're gonna chase you down with their horse and buggies. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're the ones that do the horse and buggies, right? Yes, they are. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how they can do it. <laughs> More power to them, you know, but I, I can do it. Uh, like I have my car. <laughs> But I still think bumper stickers on their horse and buggies would be great. You know, like gay pride uh, bumper stickers. Yeah. <laughs> or perhaps a pink triangle. <laughs> <laughs> what a pretty rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my wow. goodness. So, Cisco, are you settled in yet? Yeah, I just actually sat down and... Uh... To see you guys, and uh, I'm sorry I missed uh, sorry I missed the show from the beginning, but I'm definitely uh, I'm looking forward to the podcast. Well, we're sorry you're not feeling good, Cisco. Yeah, it just it just started uh, a couple hours ago, actually, when I was uh, on Twitter. But uh, yeah, taking some Alka-Seltzer, and I'm, I'm hoping to feel better by by tomorrow. But uh, how's everyone today? How's everyone doing? <laughs> Well, I'm good. If I was any better, they'd make a law against me. <laughs> I thought they already had. <laughs> You're not supposed to tell anybody. <laughs> oh, my. Depends on what Well, state. I'm doing pretty good out here in Hawaii. That's excellent. It's a little chilly up here, but I'm good. I'm great. I can't complain. What's What's a little chilly? What What's the temp? <laughs> What's that? What, what's the temperature? What's a little chilly up there? Oh, goodness, I don't know. It can't be above 50. Burr. That's right. I, I, I just wanted to hear that because I knew Kali would get goosebumps and start shivering a little bit. Just hearing that uh, number. I'll get you for that later, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this is the guy that tells us about the beautiful sunsets and the 80 degrees and the uh. beaches and all the boys with no shirts on and all this, and I'm not supposed to say nothing, huh? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, it's just about getting on a plane, and you too can enjoy it. <sighs> Turnabout's always fair play in my book. Yeah, right? Isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what goes around comes around. Jamie just became my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> I can see Jamie with the Jamie with the spray can and putting that prime. Well, tipping's gotten so passe, so I think painting should be the new pastime up here. I used to do tipping when I was younger in Texas. That was so much fun. <laughs> Yeah, dude, we gotta ask Robin Cisco. Y'all know what tipping is, Robin Cisco? When those cows wake up after you tip them, you better get out their way. <laughs> if I can uh, interject, uh, uh, Wes, my partner here, uh, would like uh, to uh, say a few words, if he may. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Of course. <laughs> hey, 
Wes. Hey, Wes. Hi, Wes. Hello. Hey, guys. Just wanted to say good morning to everybody or good afternoon or whatever. And I'm really enjoying this program today. Uh, uh, I'd certainly like to thank all the guests for joining in. Uh, very informative. Um, both Kaylee and I have been involved here for a number of years um, in equality, uh, serving on the uh, Civil Union Civil Rights Movement. Um, finally, we've got uh, a law coming into effect next year for um, partnerships, but it takes all of us to do this kind of work. I'm, I'm kind of old school, but it's certainly encouraging to see the younger folk getting involved today. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Wakeley. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Wakeley. I always love his little input. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he sometimes likes to throw his two cents in there. <laughs> Memorex 1995 Wakeley Priceless. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. So uh so Jamie, what do you do for fun up there? I mean besides cow tipping. <laughs> oh boy. Um travel a lot. Travel a lot. I bet. <laughs> Away from there, huh? <laughs> really isn't much to do. I mean, we yeah, have your you local Walmart. But... <laughs> <laughs> we have your local Walmart. I think there's got. Kind of, I think it's a national law that you have to have one of those at least three of them in every town. <laughs> um, but uh, that, that's pretty much all that's up here. The closest mall is close to 45 minutes away. So. Well, that's not too not bad. Much. <laughs> Is it a big mall? Is it a good mall, or is it some little? Oh no, no! It's 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 a little rinky dink mall. There's <laughs> probably like maybe ten, twelve stores in there. Most of them are closed. Oh, one step above a strip center. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> but I got a lot of friends up here that that I hang out with who who are very accepting and very supportive. So I spend a lot of time with them. That works. Awesome. And, and where are you located? Uh, St. Lawrence County, up uh, northern New York. Slighted. We only have one Walmart here. But <laughs> we don't have any of this city yet, so we're, we're far behind. We just got a target. So. <laughs> well, if, you, if you're ever in the New York City area and um, you know you want to get away, we're, we're in the city, and you're more than welcome to uh, pop in and hang out and, and spend the night if, if you if you want to get away and or if you or if you ever want to talk or if you ever want to talk to someone yeah um, at the end of the show we'll definitely uh, trade trade telephone numbers and uh, yeah that'd be that'd be that would be great definitely yeah okay, sometimes you just need to get away and come into the city and you know yeah you know I've never been to New York City. Of all the places in the world I've ever been that I wanted to go, I've never been to New York City. Wow. Well, we would love to bring home. <laughs> Especially <laughs> since you've been so close for so long. Yeah. Well, it would just be great to talk about also the, just the same, same, uh, just everything that's going on right now and, uh, and then just connect on, on the LGBT issues and, uh, sit down and talk about a lot of the things that are going on currently and, uh, yeah, it's just great to connect. Yeah. I've seen the LGBT um, sites here in the city. Yes, the center. Center to Stonewall to to um, Christopher Street and, and Times Square area. It's, it's, it's a great city. Yeah, definitely. Exciting. Bring the kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't know what you're asking here. <laughs> it wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't be the same without them. <laughs> no, no, they're they're the love of my life. They're, they're the best things that ever happened to me. Even if they are crying right now. 
It's a small house. I don't have any place to go to get away from them right now. <laughs> uh, hey, well, that's okay. They're, you know, goodness, they're not they're not that bad. No, no, they're they're relatively well behaved. My three year old's a handful every once in a while, but you know, she's she's great. So, Cisco. Yeah. You missed the podium stuff. Did you have anything that you wanted to throw out? I mean, you can have your podium time if you want. Um, well, me? Oh, no, I'm oh, sorry. Cisco. <laughs> asking Cisco if he wanted. I know, Jamie, you opted out on the podium, so. Yes, I did. <laughs> but Cisco, Cisco came late. He, you know, I always got to, we got to do the podium thing so that everyone gets to say, if, you, if they had some absolute, I got to say this during the show. So they got to have that time, you know, so that they can't say, I didn't get a chance to say, you know, they get whiny. So you got to give them a <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just basically wanted to say uh, uh, thank you for for the for everyone showing up. Uh, we were hoping that we would definitely get a representation from the transgender community, and I, I definitely am looking to learn myself more on, on different aspects of the transgender community because I mean we have tons of friends like our friend Daphne uh, that's originally from Chicago, and um, you know it's, it's always interesting to hear. The different struggles. I mean, our, our genders change, and, and 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 I guess our names change, but really the struggle is the same. I mean, we're each just trying to get what we deserve, which is just the equal uh, rights of our, you know, neighbors, our brothers and sisters. So uh, uh, I'm really just caught off guard. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Sorry, but uh, I really want to thank everyone for, for, for coming in and, and representing because really that's what it's all about. It's about representing and uh, definitely getting the message across and, and showing people that we are all the same. We really, we really are. I mean, there's no difference. Uh, the only difference is that um, really there is there really is no difference. I mean, we're all, we're all the same. Huh? Yeah. Just live and let live and love and let love and let's stop making life harder than what it needs to be and just uh, be equal with our neighbors and brothers and sisters. Hey, Jamie, let's touch a little bit on terminology because I know sometimes I've seen, like I've written on it, don't ever use an ED on the end of transgender and make transgendered because that is offensive, you know, and then you got transsexual and, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I just, you know, what what's offensive, what's not offensive, what's the difference between some of the terms, and kind of a little identification thing for someone out there that just like has been hiding under a rock for thirty years, you know, that kind of expla explanation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a lot of the terminology is based on the individual too, because I mean, and the way it's used, mainly. Um, I mean, I I don't have a problem with the term transgendered. I mean, that's how I consider myself. Mm -hmm. um, other people may, um, but uh, for me, it's it's not so much the term. Like I said, it's the it's the way that it's used and the the terminology terminology that's used around it and what it's being used to uh, to explain or to express. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, any any term can be a term of endearment if if that person so chooses to let it be. Right, right, right. Um, I've, I've run across so many people that have that have used the word queer and not minded it, and then I've heard heard it used as as a uh, defamation, and where it's it's just so offensive that um, you know that you can't help but be sickened by the way that it's used, not by the word itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't know if I answered your question, but <laughs> no, it's okay. I, I just you know I know. I got in trouble. I'll just tell the reason I asked the question. It's because I, I was telling the story of Duana Johnson. Uh, do, are you familiar with the story? No, I'm not. Well, Duana Johnson was from Mississippi. And uh, when the news first came out, the, the news articles didn't really state, you know, whether she was actually uh, a cross-dresser or a full-time 24-7 transgender. And, but they did state she was a prostitute. You know, the first article I read was slamming her. You know, it wasn't a pro-LGBT article. 
and uh, so it obviously didn't have good information. Anyway, uh, so this video surfaced on the internet about her getting beat up in in the custody of the Memphis Police Department, uh, where the cop had on his handcuffs, using them like as brass knuckles and beating her on the face and all this stuff. And uh, Ooh. yeah, yeah, she she uh, because uh, when she was in the the processing room, the the cop was hey he she hey it. And hey, you know that's how. He, and Ooh. of course, she wasn't that's responding. That's the one term that boils my blood is it. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> she wouldn't respond, so the cop went over there and and started punching her and sp- sprayed her with pepper spray. Uh, put his handcuffs on and used them as like brass knuckles and was hitting her with them and all that. Just beat up stuff out of her. All kinds of people standing around doing nothing. They're just putting like their their shirts over their mouth, you know, and nose because of the pepper spray smell. And even at one point his partner actually held her in a chair while he was beating her. And uh Oh my goodness. Yeah, his partner was still on probation and he got fired immediately after this video surfaced. And the other one, Bridges McRae, is the one that's currently undergoing charges uh uh an under federal prosecution actually. And uh, and has also gotten in trouble for income tax evasion, by the way. Uh, but anyway, so after Duana gets out of jail, contacts the lawyer. They bring charges against the city, the police department there in uh, Mississippi, or I'm mean, sorry, Memphis, Tennessee. And um, next thing you know, after the charges were brought and the lawyer and the federal authorities get involved and everything else, all of a sudden Duana ends up execution style shot in the head. Ooh. Yeah, and no, no, there's no investigation, there's no tip, there's no hint, there's no suspects, there's no nothing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah really bad, nasty story. And, uh, That's a sad state of the, of the United States today, unfortunately. Yeah. That's yeah. something that should have been on America's Most Wanted. I mean, there was no reason why that story wasn't on America's Most Wanted, where it should have went full force, and something should have came out of that, because that's just amazing that another human being who would have that happen, and us as a society would say that, oh well, you know, on to the next thing, I mean, that just should have never happened, that should be definitely worldwide on a hunt for this person, and we all know who, I mean, from what it sounds like, we definitely all know who did it, I mean, it's no secret from just the story, itself, just observing the story itself. Well, like I've often said in the past, it's a, it's you know it's a media thing. They, uh, you know, they will only pick and choose what they want to show on the media, and you know, unfortunately, uh, GLBT uh, QI issues aren't. Um, I, I guess they're just not sensational enough for them, and it's a shame because a story like this really deserves worldwide attention. Um, you really need to uh, sh- show the world the kind of treatment that we are getting and the kind of things that we, we as a community, all of us, are having to endure, you know, whether or not it's a situation like this or, you know, something out in the street or whatever. Uh, these issues, they need attention. They... they uh, this is one of the ways that we're going to change people's minds is if we show them all of our issues and not just uh, what the media at large would want to what would want the public to see. And I think that's a shame because uh, had this gone worldwide, I think that uh, we probably would have seen a much different result. Definitely, there would have been more pressure. I mean, for one thing from, I mean, the surrounding communities to solve something like that. Yeah, I think it says a lot about the geographical area because we had, you know, we had that incident happen uh, not too long before that, or was it right after, in Greeley, Colorado, where the transgender woman got word, murdered, uh, got beat with a, a fire extinguisher. And uh, the, gentleman that did, the gentleman that did that got like 30 or 40 years. So it's, it's you know... It's a, I, you know, they say justice is blind, but I, I just, I, I guess I'm blind because I don't see it. <laughs> you know? No, no. Thirty or forty years? I mean, they should have, you know, put him in jail for the rest of his life and thrown away the key. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, something like that. That's such a hate-driven crime. 
that, I mean, that's not something that you, you learn your way out of by being in prison. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that's, that's just pent up aggression that, I don't know, to, to let somebody like that out in, like you said, 30 or 40 years is, is just unsettling. Especially yeah. considering that, you know, going to the prison often heartens a person, and that's only going to make him worse. Right. Yeah, yeah. At that point, we should, we should really use, I mean, we use mice to to experiment on. At that point, we should use that person to experiment on just to see the thought process that goes along behind something like that, because maybe it could help us maybe understand that that person was... A closet case. I mean, a person. That person. I mean, it could have been so many different things that, uh, if we would have definitely used that person to understand why, then maybe we could learn from it enough to help someone else. Because that's the thing. We're we're quick to 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 say that this person is you know foul enough to put him in jail, but in all reality, we really have to understand the thought process behind a lot of this stuff because. If we don't, we're just going to continue with the same hate crimes and the violence. You see, it's it's it's, it's got to be a point where where we look beyond above and beyond uh, doing the same thing what this person did to unfortunately the person that he took the life away from. You know, we we we, we experiment and, and and really see what's what's the thought process behind this. Why 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 did this happen? Well, and, right. and the other thing we have to remember is, you know, a lot of these behaviors start at home. And uh, what what was his home life? What You know, what happened to him that made him the way he is? I mean, uh, you know, was there violence in his home? Was there uh, alcoholism in his home? Nobody really knows these things. And so it, it's really kind of hard to... Uh, get a true picture of someone unless you really can know the background and uh, you know a lot of these things are learned in the home and through society's pressures and it's uh, until we change our society to be a more loving and accepting society we're going to continue to see these kinds of things happen but yeah we're just in a society where instead of trying to take the time let's say what we could learn in two years uh, we end up throwing it away, and we end up taking the time and, and not learning anything. And it takes us 10 years to realize that, oh, my God, what, what are we doing? When if we would have taken the time and just taken the two years to realize that we can address these issues while they're here in front of us and they're fresh in our face and fresh in our minds, then, you know, we'll, we'll learn. But we, we just, we're, we're quick to throw things away, quick to lock things, quick to lock people up. Quick to you know, we we do that with our family, we do that with our friends, and it's got to come to a point where we really are trying to learn from each other and 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 why are things the way they are instead of trying to change people's minds because you really can't change people's minds if if, they, if it's not something they want or they want to learn you can't change anyone but if you actually take the time to help people understand why the thought process was this way because maybe he was abused as a child so he had a little aggression or you know whatever the case may be on the individual because it, it definitely is an individual thing um then that will help us grow as humans but so we take the time and realize that we have to really seriously look at these things and analyze them observe them and do what we do to mice do it to each other unfortunately when something like this happens you do it to the person that took the life away or abused the person and Use them at that point. They're 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 they're, uh, they're, uh, they're science. You know that's that's basically it's, it's a guinea pig at that point. The human being's a guinea pig at that point, and see uh, see see what we can learn from this. To to me personally, that's kind of like I, I you know not to be offensive to anyone or anything, but that's almost like putting a band band aid over a bleeding juggler vein. The whole thing, I think, bottoms down to the education, and and not so much what we're teaching, but what we're not teaching. The fact that we and when we're teaching it, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but when we're teaching it, yep. And and then I, the fact that we leave out anything to mention in most public school systems, anything that mentions anything LGBT positive, uh, you know, in any through history, through, I mean, and we've got tons, tons of people that were LGBT in our history of our world that that, that they just gloss over, they never even mention, you know, and the, fa- the absence of that information 
causes us to be pariahs in society where if all they did was teach you know Leonardo da Vinci you know etc 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 and they started tre teaching honestly and let people research a little on their own and then we wouldn't be the abnormal or the odd or the, we would just be just like everybody else so that when these people who might have some mental problems or whatnot you know uh, want to pick up on the person they hate the most it won't be us because we've been normalized through a un obstructed teaching system, you know, where they are not censoring the information. You know, that's just right. wrong. But and I, I agree with you, Tom, but, you know, by the same token, we also need to change how our media uh, portrays us, too. I mean, we're not all the, uh, the leather queens that are parading down the street during gay pride, you know, for instance. <laughs> You know, and this is the things that the media covers, and it's it's uh, it's a shame because you know we are a family of people that do good things. Uh, we are a family of people that are great act activists, and you know the media just doesn't tend to pick up on that, and it's a shame because we really do need to show the good things that we're doing. You know, it really wouldn't matter what the media said if they weren't indoctrinated throughout the whole entire education system. I really wouldn't, Jamie. I gotta ask you. We're, we're down. We're getting close here. We got nine minutes left on the show, Jamie. I gotta, you sure. know, I, I I gotta get your 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 uh, feelings on this. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned the Greeley issue. You know, and and her getting killed uh, by this lover ish situation, and because it was a sex thing. I, I, and I, it, it sounds like, but if, when you read in between the lines, that like this guy didn't know that this trans person still had male genitalia and I'm right. think, so I'm thinking it was a panic thing you know that happened so so then we get into the question of, of do you tell these people before you get to that point you know uh, to save possibly this from happening because I think there's probably been many cases where the person just freaked out and had this panic thing and not that I'm saying that's justified but if it wouldn't have been a surprise maybe they wouldn't have never gone there and maybe that wouldn't have never happened and I just kind of wanted to get your feelings on that well, I think it's human nature to lash out when something surprises you. I mean, it's it's. I personally, I chalk it up as uh, the flight or, uh, fight or flight response. To be completely honest with you, and uh, you're right, it's not right, it's not acceptable. <clears throat> but I think it's human nature, and especially if the person is so afraid of be the person who's been surprised is so afraid of being labeled one way or another, they're going to take it as a, as something to lash out over. Um, personally, I, I'm completely honest with everybody that I talk to. I mean, um, I don't like to make people feel uncomfortable, and I don't like to surprise people. Um, I, I find that it, it diffuses problems that may arise. And uh, I've heard of many stories where people have been like that. They brought somebody home and not told them, A, that they were either you know male to female or female to male, or that they hadn't had the operation and it had adverse responses to it. So, I mean, honestly, I, I think I think honesty is the best policy. You know, and be up front with somebody, and you'd be amazed at how many people will actually not care. Right. You know, it, it just diffuses the situation, like I said, before it starts. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I mean, it, definitely, no, that's no justification, but I'm, I'm saying, goodness, you know, we've seen that happen many times. I just can't imagine somebody would put themselves in that position, you know, that just, wow, you know. Right. Wow, wow, wow. Well, uh, we're down to six minutes left. Jamie, anything that you didn't get to say you want to say? Um, not really that I can think of. Just, uh, you know, I, I want to thank everybody out there for doing what they are and, you know, doing the best they can and being who they are. I've met a lot of beautiful people online and uh, in the community. And, you know, I, I think everybody's beautiful in their own way. We just need to hold on to that more, you know. Just, thank just you, take thank a stand you. for who we are who we want to be. Cisco, last words? I have to agree with you with education and, and definitely being uh, who, who you are, that plays a major part. I mean, uh, as, as soon as you realize who you are and what part you play in this community, then, you, you know, everything else is, is cake because, you, you know, you end up connecting with so many good people. We have so many good people within our community and so many great resources. So just, just uh, definitely uh, 
keep strong. Keep strong. And uh, when your main foundation, which is your main family, doesn't support you, just remember that your extended family, which is your LGBT community, brothers and sisters support you. And definitely hit your local LGBT centers and, and, and uh, use, the, use the resources because uh, they're there for a reason. And uh, definitely stay strong and just be yourself. Don't be anything else and don't follow anyone else. Follow your heart and just be yourself. That's, that's the moral to the story. Awesome. Well, not, no, no one can say it better, but Rob, you're going to try, aren't you? Well, same, same as what Cisco said. And, uh, you know, quality is everything. It doesn't matter if you're, what, what part of the umbrella, like I keep saying, that you're in, under in the uh, transgender community or just the lesbian and gay and bi community. Um, it's all about equality and we need to get all these rights taken care of and we need to make everybody feel as comfortable as possible and um, people like um, our friend Daphne and and Julie and Melissa and you Joni I mean you people you you are very powerful and your voices are very powerful even though Julie's was written it was still very powerful and um, I'm glad um, Mara was able to be here today and and Khalil and, and Tom, you every every uh, round table put it up and get it going. We thank you for that. Your turn, Khalil. Well, I'd first I'd want to uh, just say uh, thanks to all of our guests that we had on our show today. I think your stories, your work, your activism and is, is very, very important for our community. I also would like to say thank you to Noah uh, for posting the uh, links to his websites on Queer Public Radio. Uh, I th- hope that uh, some of the uh, trans members and the GLBT members in Chicago take a look at some of these uh, links because they are very, very important. Uh, I also want to say thank you, Tom, for hosting us, and... Uh, on to the uh, next show, huh? What what are we uh, going to talk about next time? Ah, he always remembers the. Me- I tell you, the man's got a memory like a safe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What should we talk about next time? Hmm. And, and since I suggested this topic, uh, let's uh, get one from Robert Cisco, maybe. I thought Robert Cisco dis- d- brought this one up. No, it was me. It was probably, we had discussed it, but it was probably, yeah, we brought up on at the uh, show. I know we did Pride the week before. Um, um, we did Marriage Equality. Oh, that's right, Pride the week before. and then So it's my turn, damn it. Y'all just hold on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> See how they do me, Jamie? <laughs> you, you know exactly, don't you? Yeah. I'm like a handful, but... <laughs> <laughs> what do you think we ought to talk about next week, Jamie? Oh, my goodness. Um, you know, I actually, I like the idea of terminology, like you, you we had kind of touched upon in this one, and uh, explaining the differences. Mm-hmm. That might be a good primary um, topic, huh? Different it, terminologies. It, 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 that even like I said, even under that that umbrella of transgender, the terminology of transvestite and crossdresser and and drag king and drag queen, the people that don't know that stuff, and there's so many other tr- terminology out there with the hanky code, with the just different lots of terminology. Well, let's just do <laughs> that, that next that week. That might be a good umbrella topic is uh, the hanky code because I know there was uh, some. Uh, Robin Cisco had mentioned to me uh, in a private phone conversation about uh, some folks that are still using the hanky code. So maybe we should explain that what that is to the community. Well, I think term- just LGBTQIA terminology in general, communications, uh, codes, hank, all that kind of stuff. That's great. Sounds yeah. good. Great idea. Thanks, Jamie. What a wonderful idea. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Jamie, for coming on and sharing your uh, story with us. Anytime. Yeah, Jamie, thank you so much. Uh, hopefully you can uh, 
you can uh, be on next next round table, the yeah. XY Weekly show. That would be amazing. And uh, I would love to. Definitely. You're welcome to join QueerPublicRadio.com. And uh, it's free. It doesn't cost nothing. And then we've got a special little roundtable group that's hidden. It's private. Only us can access it. And we talk about the roundtable and what we're going to do and our research. We throw research notes and stuff between shows. And you're welcome to be with us as one of our official panelist members if you want. That would would be great. I would like that very much. You don't have to be on every show. I mean, just you you can. Yay. Yay! <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> we just cashed in, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the invite. I appreciate that very much. Oh, you're quite welcome. Yeah, so so we always well, we love to have more uh, roundtable members. We're even thinking about extending, and if we get too many members, we'll just do two shows a week, you know, with a different set of members on each one or something. Whatever, yeah. you know. So yeah, you'd be more than welcome. We would love to have you. Well, let me do the wrap up here and thank you, Jamie, and thank you, Kali, and thank you, Cisco, and thank you, Rob. Good. Hey, don't forget about Mira. And oh, Mara, and oh, Wei Kaylee too. Thank you, Wei Kaylee, for your uh, input. Julie. Thank you, Julie. Oh, uh, yes. Oh, and Julie, Julie's little written note. Yes, yes, that was pure awesomeness. Thank you for taking the time to write that, and thank you, Rob, for sharing it with us. Thank you. That was awesome. That was totally awesome. I got to listen to it again because I got a couple little messages that popped up right in the middle of it, and I missed some of the good juicy stuff. But I'll get back. Just send it over to you. So if you want to put it up on on, on your site, um, we'll send you the uh, the verbiage over. Oh, cool. Well, you know, hey, that's what podcasts are for. You know, we can go back and listen again. There you go. So thanks, everybody. Awesomeness. We are all one human family. I cannot say that often enough, and I want everybody to know that means every single person on this globe is your brother and sister. And that's that's just so, 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 so important to remember because we all are supposed to love our brothers and sisters. And I, I hope you'll, you'll remember that, you know, because as I said earlier in the show, it's just four simple wor- letters. L-O-V-E is a little four-letter word. We know four-letter words aren't always good, but that's the best one in the world, love, because that could conquer all. It's the magic key. If we just all have love for our fellow human family members, All the ills of the world could be solved. We'll see you next time. Yeah. I love you, and you, and you, oh, and you too, and don't forget him. I love her, and him, and her, and him, and him, and her. I love you all. Adios. Have a nice trip. Bon voyage. Farewell to me. We'll leave the light on for you.